We're continuing our series called Dreams to Remember, and this is our third week in the series of six messages. And I've said each week that there are actually 14 recorded dreams in Scripture, uh, dreams that God overtly says that these were supernatural. These were ones that he recognizes as being from himself. We'll deal with six of those. And we said each week, and I will continue through the series, that the focus of this series, it's not really about dreams in the sense of, you know, those goals and ambitions and things that we want to achieve, pursuing those. It's it's not about that. It's also not about uh, learning some sort of a spiritual formula to interpret our dreams because our dreams are just weird. You guys dream about your teeth falling out and how weird can that be? (laughs) And, and so, there, you know, there's no trustworthy way to interpret dreams. There's nothing you can buy, uh, no one that can do that. It's not about that. We also said that this is not a series where we're trying to heighten our spiritual senses to some level that we can start having more supernatural dreams come into our life. That's not what this series is about. What it is about, we said, is that we are looking at these dreams that the living God saw fit to have pinned down and recorded, 14 in all of Scripture. We're going to look at six of them. But we are not looking at the dream per se, but we're looking at the dream as sort of a lens to look at the dream giver. We want to look at the dream in a way that we get a picture of the one that gave the dream and what is he about. For example, in the first message, we found that he is the God that warns. He warns his people because he loves his people. Last week, we found that he he is the God who reveals. The dream taught us that, that he reveals the truth about life. And today we're going to find that he's the God that guides. We're going to look at a dream that indicates that that God guides his people all through our lives. And and I just want to say that, um, you know, this this, this church experience, we're we're going into our 18th, 18th year now. It has been an extraordinary experience of God's guidance. But I also want to carefully say that most of the time that God has guided this work, has guided this church... I personally have had very little sense of overt, crystal clear guidance, okay? It was usually after the fact that I could look back and I was like, oh my goodness, Lord, I I see your hand now. I see it here. I see it there. Oh, at that fork in the road, I saw it there. I did not have it in the majority of cases uh, when it was occurring. Now, I'm just curious, how many of you in the past year, you've maybe uh, faced some sort of decision, some sort of a situation where you really, really sought and really wanted the crystal clear guidance of God. You wanted it to be so clear that you couldn't miss the mark. You were seeking Him earnestly. How many have done something like that in the past year? Let me see your hands. Okay, and I have two. Now what I won't do is I won't ask how many of you received the crystal clear you know, guidance, the kind that we... we in other words, the sort of guidance we want is the kind that is foolproof. We, we, we want it to be... God has put his stamp of approval on it, so we know this is take it to the bank kind of stuff. I mean, I I won't ask you how many of you receive that kind of guidance, but I'm going to share with you that I tend to think many of you at least did not receive that kind of crystal clear guidance. And so we have to ask ourselves a question. Why is it that when many of us earnestly seek God for crystal clear guidance, we don't receive it? And truth be told, we don't receive it some of you in this room didn't receive it this year if you were very honest do you want to know why because you're evil that's why (laughs) and so am i no that's that's not why but there is a good biblical reason and so we're going to look at that today here's what i hope that we'll allow the lord to do for us today is to enable each of us to walk out of here today we that have put our faith and our trust in Christ, and even we that are just thinking about doing that, that we'll walk out of here today better understanding how God actually guides us in this life so, so that we won't be discouraged when we don't get the crystal clear guidance that we're seeking and so that we'll still understand how God's guidance works uh, even when we don't always know that it's working, if, if that makes any sense. So what we're going to do is we're going to revisit our character from last week, a guy named Jacob. And if you don't mind turning to Genesis chapter 31, it's the first book of your Bible, so you won't have any need for the page number. And and I want to give you just a, a bit of background. We left Jacob last week where he had deceived his brother Esau, his twin brother, out of his birthright and out of his family blessing. 
And his mother sends him away because she had found out that Esau intended to kill Jacob once their father had passed away. And so Jacob was on the run, running for his life. He was forced to go to a strange land some 400 miles away to his mother's brother's house, Laban. Uh, She sends Jacob off there, and I'm sure Jacob was confused and bewildered and scared and angry at himself and, and full of unresolved guilt and all those things that we talked about last week. But he was on the run, and it was in that condition that he was guilty. He was soiled. He was not somebody yielded to God doing the right thing, but yet he really did have a faith in God that God revealed himself to Jacob in a unique way in a dream that we dealt with last week, a dream that gave a clear revelation of the truth about life. He continues in his journey, and he makes his some 400-mile journey, and he finally ends up at the place where his uncle Laban resides. And he meets his uncle Laban's daughter, a lady named Rachel. And as soon as he sees her, he falls head over heels in love with Rachel and, and just wants nothing more than to marry her. Uh, Laban, you know, talks to Jacob and says, come stay with me and so on. And and they arrange it where Laban will give Rachel, his daughter, to Jacob as his wife. But there is a price. He says, I'll give you my daughter, Rachel, if you will work for me for not one, not two, not five, but seven years. Now, guys, I'm not going to embarrass you. But how many of you guys, just think this one through, how many of you guys would have given seven years' salary for your wife. Don't, 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 don't answer that one. Don't, don't. Of course we would have. And more. <laughs> anyway, he works for seven years for Rachel. And the scripture says it seemed like but a day because this guy was like crazy in love, you know. And so it comes the wedding night, and, uh, you know, they didn't have street lights and electric. Electricity and, and all that kind of thing. It was very dark, and so he goes into his wedding night, into his tent, thinking he's going to have his wedding night with his wife, Rachel. And when the sun comes up the next day, he finds not Rachel there beside him, but Leah, her sister. And he's completely confused and shocked and unhappy. He worked for seven years for Rachel. He wakes up with Leah, no Rachel. He goes to Laban, what is this thing you are doing? And Laban says, oh, well, you know, it, it's our custom that you, uh, you always have to marry off the older sister first. And he's like, you've got to be kidding me. And Laban says, but, 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 but it's okay, it's okay. Work for me another seven years, and I'll, give, I'll throw Rachel in, in the bargain. And he does it. <laughs> he does it. Now, he gives Rachel right then and there, you know, but... Jacob still has to work for another seven years, 14 years in total. Now, this is interesting because if you recall Jacob's past, he is quite a trickster, quite a deceiver, quite a con artist, quite a schemer. And you can kind of see he's met his match when he meets Uncle Laban. And you can see behind the scenes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uncle Uncle Laban's going to trim his wings for him. But you see behind the scenes the, the hand of a loving God saying, Jacob, This part of your character, my son, my child, I'm going to help you work that out. We're we're going to get rid of that. You're going to to have to learn a lesson or two and maybe learn the hard way. Guys, did the lights just get brighter back there? Because something, either that or I'm going blind. By the way, last week, uh, you were in the second service, and my wife said, gee, I thought you were having a stroke up there. (laughs) Because I, I, I literally, I couldn't read. I was looking at the page, and and it was boring. So I I have specs with me today. (laughs) So if you saw me get completely confused last week, I was not having a stroke or even one of those mini strokes they warn us all about, but I just couldn't see. So now I have specs. Anyway, so Jacob stays there for 14 years, and he starts to have children in in an uh, expanded family, and and of course it was unusual in the way they did things in those days. the, the two wives ended up saying, I want you also to have some children by my, my handmaid and so forth. So he ends up with four different women that he's having children by. He ends up with 12 kids before all is said and done. So it reaches a point where Rachel, who was having a very hard time to bear children, she finally has a child. And at that point, Jacob says, you know, I think it's time to go back home. And remember the dream from last week. God promised. He said, Jacob, I'll be with you everywhere you go. I will take care of you. I will prosper you. And I will bring you back to this land. It was that land, the land of Canaan, that God had promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and then to Jacob. And he says, I'll bring you back. So he already had God's clear plan for his life. It was to be brought back to the land. 
And now Jacob comes to a point where he says, you know, I think it might be time to go back. What we will find out is that he has now been there for 20 years. He left thinking, I'll just run away for a while until my brother's anger subsides. He ends up staying 20 years. 20 years. So that's the context uh, of when we pick up now reading in chapter 31. And so as not to frighten you that I'm having a stroke, dear wife back there, I've got my specs on today. Genesis 31, and I, I do hope you'll read with me. Uh, I mean, not out loud, of course. That'll confuse me terribly. But <laughs> All right. It says, Jacob heard that Laban's sons were saying, Jacob has taken everything our father owned and has gained all this wealth from what belonged to our father. And Jacob noticed that Laban's attitude toward him was not what it had been. Then the Lord, notice this, the Lord somehow, we're not told how, speaks to Jacob. Then the Lord said to Jacob, go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives and I will be with you. So Jacob sent word to Rachel and Leah to come out to the fields where his flocks were. He said to them, I see that your father's attitude toward me is not what it was before, but the God of my father has been with me. Jacob really did trust God, and he knew God was with him. You know that I've worked for your father with all my strength, yet your father has cheated me by changing my wages how many times? Ten times. Laban was quite a schemer. However... God has not, not allowed him to harm me. If he said the speckled ones will be, and I'll explain this to you in a minute. If he said the speckled ones will be your wages, then all the flocks gave birth to speckled young. And if he said the streak ones will be your wages, then all the flocks bore streaked young. So God has taken away your father's livestock and has given them to me. Here's the dream sequence. In breeding season, I once had a dream in which I looked up and I saw the male goats mating with the flock were streaked, speckled, or spotted. The angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, I answered, here I am. And he said, look up and see that all the male goats mating with the flock are streaked, speckled, or spotted. For I have seen what Laban has been doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now leave this land at once and go back to your native land. Let me just kind of unpack this a bit. When Jacob wanted to leave earlier, you can read it on your own sometime in chapter 30, Laban convinces him to stay, and he says, listen, let's work a deal where you can earn some wages for yourself. And he says, here's what we'll do. You know, all the sheep that are speckled or streaked or spotted, Jacob, as they're born, they can be your personal property. You know, you can have something for yourself. But all the regular sheep will be mine. Well, as time went on, evidently, Laban kept changing this. You know, if, if a lot of spotted sheep were being born, Laban would say, oh, Jacob, I want to change the deal. Uh, I'm going to give you the streaked ones, but not the spotted ones. And then, all of a sudden, all the sheep would start having streaked ones. And Laban would say, hey, hey Jacob, you know, this isn't working out. I, I'm going I'm to go back to the spotted ones. You know, and they, he just kept changing, changing, changing. But God was with Jacob. And it really didn't matter what Laban's designs were. And some of you need to hear this. It really doesn't matter sometimes what kind of harmful designs other people may have upon you or me or the work of God. When God's with his people and with you and I, it, it really doesn't amount to much what someone's efforts may do in the long run. Anyway, so he receives this dream, and the dream is more of one of timing. It's guidance. He's telling Jacob, now is the time. 20 years have gone by. Now is the time to return to your homeland. Now, this was not new, as I said before. God always said that he was going to bring Jacob back to the land, but it was the timing that God brought guidance on. And, and so that's, that's the main thing I want to emphasize for you. So what we want to do is look at this subject in terms of the way that God guides and, and, and how can we um, discern his guidance and when can we expect it, and so on. First of all, the point that I want to first start with is one that some of us will probably find a bit peculiar. We can count on God's guidance. We can expect it only when it's necessary. You say, Randy, you know, of course it's always necessary. We're, we're supposed to always be uh, yielded to God, and, and I would agree with that. I mean, we, we should always be devoted to God and His Word and His will and always wanting to do His will. 
we should always pray our way through our life and all our decisions. But what I am saying is the truth is, is that the reason, and you admitted to this, um, although you didn't raise your hand, I'm sure it was true, the reason that you and the reason that I sometimes seek earnestly God's guidance on certain subjects, certain issues, and we don't get it. If we were honest, we'd say we never really got the kind of clear guidance that we wanted. And the reason we don't get it is because it frankly wasn't necessary. Sometimes we simply don't need the kind of clarity that we think we need. There are issues in life that are, that are not so defining as we might think. They're not so urgent as we might think. And so sometimes we don't get our answer from God in the kind of clarity, the kind of specificity that we want because it's simply not necessary. Now when it comes to the subject of guidance, uh, God's people tend to be, you know, in one or two camps. There are some of God's people that kind of feel like, well, we sort of have the, the right to just sort of manage our lives and develop our lives and frame and shape our lives in the direction and our lifestyle any way we want. And as long as we're not overtly sinful, you know, that, that's, that's good with God. And then, of course, if we get, in ourself, get ourselves in a jam or we get confused, we pray for God's guidance. And that's one approach. But basically, that camp of God's people don't seek God's guidance very much. The second camp, and this tends to be the, the plight of the more uh, spiritually earnest followers of Christ, is we want, or we tend to want, or this camp tends to want, guidance in, in a very, very specific, minute form. In other words, there is literally the longing that everything that I do all the time will be not my will, but God's. We even know that that's sort of a, a scriptural thing. Not my will, but yours be done. And what this camp of believers tends to want, really, is kind of a robotic-like relationship with God. In other words, that, that everything we do, every decision we make, we want God to somehow speak, somehow give us a sign. Somehow we don't want to make any decisions. We really we want to know that every single decision that we ever make, it's not our decision. That's God's. That's God's decision. I didn't make that decision. And what we really think would be ideal is if God would make it so clear to us that we would just be like a robot. Go here. Okay, Randy, it's okay. Pick the water up now. Is it okay, Lord, to put it back down? It's okay to put it back down. Lord, I'm going to look at the Bible now. Is it okay? Yes, it's okay. I mean, that's being overly silly and dramatic, but it's not totally unlike the kind of guidance that some Christians seek and think is the ideal, that it would always be crystal clear, everything we do. Now, the truth is there, is there is a balance. And, and whenever we want balance, we have to go to the Word of God. That's where He has revealed His primary will. And the balance for you and I, it's to look at Christ. I mean, is, is this the way that Christ folk, uh, functioned, for example? Did, did He stop every few seconds rather robotically and awkwardly and, Father, should I do this? Father, should I do that? Is it okay to do this? No. No, in Christ, we see someone that moved very freely. He made decisions easily. Now, yet he was very prayerfully dependent and in tune with his Father. He was in tune with his Father's will, in tune with his Father's word. He was exemplifying for you and I what it looks like when a human is perfectly aligned to the will and the word of God. But Jesus made decisions easily. He asserted his will, but his will was already yielded to the Father. He, he didn't always have that robotic kind of guidance. He didn't feel that it was necessary. That's the balance for you and I. What God is looking for, He is looking for, He is looking to develop you and I into mature sons and daughters that are so devoted to Him, that have such trust in Him, that love Him so much, that understand His words so well, that are so saturated with His truth, that we spontaneously always choose to do those things that God would want done. We are mature sons and daughters. We're making decisions. We're asserting our will. But our will, our hearts are so in tune with God that we're doing exactly what the Father wants. And what's even cooler yet, we're doing it with the creative powers that He's given to us. We're taking these creative powers that are devoted to Him and in creative ways we are coming up with strategies that glorify Him, honor Him, further His purposes and with such, he is well pleased. Now, for some of you, that's shocking. You're like, oh, I don't ever want to originate anything. I always want God to be the originator. Well, he is. He is the originator. 
through his word, through his spirit, but he wants you and I to take these wonderful minds and imaginations that he's given to us and to create some things. We're made in the image of a creator. This is a different approach to guidance than I think some of you have probably heard or felt comfortable with. Now, sometimes God doesn't give us crystal clear guidance because, as I said, we just don't need it. There's something that we are supposed to do and we're just not doing it. Let me backtrack a bit. The majority of guidance that you and I will ever need in our life, the vast majority, try to put a percentage on it in the first service. <laughs> I said 95%, but that's kind of made up. So I'm just going to say most things that you and I will ever encounter in life that we seek guidance on, we already have the guidance in God's Word. I'm going to do it. 99% of the things that you and I ever face in life, the guidance we need, it's already there. It's already in His Word. There, there's sort of a direction. There's sort of a movement that if you and I are moving in the right direction in life, in other words, if I've put my faith in Christ, I've yielded my life to God. I love God. I love His Word. I love righteousness. I'm devoted to Him. I'm devoted to His kingdom. All I want to do is see His name honored on earth and His love spread to the life of others. I'm moving. You see, I'm moving in a direction, a Christward direction. If I'm moving in that direction... 99% of the things that I need guidance on, God's already laid them out in his word. And sometimes some of us are like, oh, God, I need guidance on this. I, I just don't know what to do. And he's already spoken about it in his word. And he's saying, will you just do what I've already told you? There's a guy named Mark Batterson. He's a pastor down in D.C. He has a very, very interesting church. He's written some Christian books and he talks about in one of his books a situation where he was down at Georgetown University praying with a, a staffer for InterVarsity Press that was doing a ministry down there in Georgetown University trying to, you know, reach young college students for Christ and so on. And he said that this InterVarsity minister uh, was voicing a need in this small group. And he, and he said, you know, will you guys pray for me because we really need a computer, you know, to do this ministry right and, and I'm, I'm without a computer. So Mark Batterson, this pastor down at D.C., he said, oh, yeah, yeah, well, I'll take that to God in prayer. So let's start praying. And so Mark Batterson started praying, oh, Lord, you see that the brother, you know, he, he needs this computer for his ministry. And Mark Batterson said in the middle of his prayer, he said he didn't hear a voice or anything, but he said it was almost like God said, will you just stop? And he said his voice actually sounded in his spirit defiant, you know, a little bit stern. And he says, will you just give him the extra computer you have? And Mark Batterson says he literally stopped in the middle of the prayer and said, I think God is telling me to give you the computer, the extra computer I have. There was no need for prayer. There was no need for guidance. Sometimes you and I have within our means, God has already put within our means the exact instructions, the exact resources, and it's just a matter of doing it. We don't have to expect guidance. It's not necessary. We just need to take action. It's kind of like this. Imagine that someone came to me and they said, Randy, look, I, I want to I travel cross country. I want to go to Seattle. I've never been there before. I'm not sure how to get there. And I want you to help me. Now, that would be the bad thing to do because I'm like Mr. Magoo with directions. I, I got lost trying to go to the settlement on Friday. And I've been to the place five times. This is no joke. I, I really... So um, not a good thing to ask me for directions, but for the sake of example. So you come and you say, I want to know how to get to, to Seattle, Randy. And, you know, I'm like Mr. Magoo myself, and, you know, so you, maybe you can help me. So I say, well, sure. And so I buy you some travel books, and I get you some maps, and I buy you a TomTom, -tom, you know, and I show you how to use it and everything like that, your little GPS thing. And so I lay all these tools out, and I say, there you go. This will get you to Seattle. And then you lay them all aside and you say, oh God, living God, glorious God, God who loves and guides his people, I ask you, show me the way to Seattle. And you get in your car and you just start driving. And as you're driving, you just, you're so holy. You just keep praying, oh God, I'm so dependent on you. Guide me, oh God. That's just nonsense, right? Because I have already provided you with everything you need to get there. My point is that God has provided for you and I in the vast majority of cases, vast majority of cases, all the guidance we need in his word. Now, later on in the series or in the message, I'm going to talk about some other tools, as it were, in the box, the guidance box that God's provided for us. And so 
we don't need to be seeking this supernatural sign-oriented guidance very often. It's dangerous. People that seek sign-oriented guidance, and, and this is what some Christians do, instead of going to the Word, going to the sources that God has said, I'll guide you with, we say, oh, no, 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 I want supernatural guidance. I want signs. And the danger with sign guidance is you and I can trick ourselves. We can concoct signs. We can make ourselves believe that we're seeing signs. Uh, some of the classics that Christians do with, with the signs, uh, I, I jotted some of these down, so bear with me. I'm, I'm half blind these days. But it, 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 one of the things Christians will say when they're seeking sign guidance is, you know, it must be God. It just all fell right into place. That's the sign. Another one, another one that Christians will say, you know, I, have pe I had peace. I had peace about it. It must be God's guidance. Another one is, oh, it, it's going so well. Things are going so well. It's just got to be God's guidance. Uh, another one is, is uh, you know, there was this open door. It was an open door. An opportunity just fell right open. It's got to be God's guidance. Well, when you think about it, if you take that criteria that everything fell into place, everything's going so well, got the open door, you know, all these kinds of things, Bernie Madoff... Bernie Madoff, the crook that recently was so much in the news that, that had the scam and stole millions and millions of dollars from people for probably 15 or 20 years, he would have had all those conditions. I'm sure he had great peace as people were just throwing money at him left and right and he was buying mansions galore. I'm sure he would have said everything's going really well because there was a sucker born every moment, you know, and, and they all seemed to find their way to him. I guess he could have said, gee, it's an open door. You know, it was open season. And, and so my point is, when you and I start looking for that sign guidance, we can be easily deceived. Hey, listen, you, you and I may say, I have peace about something. Well, somebody drunk has peace too. Somebody sound asleep has peace. You may be spiritually sound asleep. You may be spiritually unconscious. You'll have peace then too. You see, peace is not always, now I'm not saying I'm going I'm to balance this out later, but peace is not always a sufficient criteria for discerning God's guidance. Nor is everything's going so well, no, is it all fell into, nor is it all fell into place. There's, there's something more substantial that you and I have to look at when we're really seeking God's will and His guidance. So, so a lot of times, the truth is, we're expecting guidance, and we're not getting it, if we're honest. We're not getting the kind of crystal clear guidance because, frankly, we don't need it. Just had an example of this in between services. Somebody came to me and uh, their, their daughter is getting ready to go off to college, you know. And so they've got three different colleges. They're all wonderful colleges. But the daughter is stressing out, as are other students in her school, because they have been told, you must pray intensely to find the one, the one school, the one school that God wants you to go to. And that's just utter nonsense. Nonsense. Listen, let me give you an example. Let's go back to the person trying to go cross-country Seattle. As long as they're moving west, okay? As long as they're moving west. There's lots of different ways they could go to Seattle. Do you agree? They don't have to take just one route. Do you agree there's, there's probably three or four or five routes to get to Seattle from here? Okay, I just want to make sure you're tracking with me. How many? Okay. The truth about this kid who's pondering three different Christian schools, colleges to go to, that one's fine. That's God's will. And that one's fine, and that one's God's will. And so is that one fine in God's will. Make a choice. It's okay. You've prayed. You're yielded. You're moving in the right direction. You want to become more like Christ. You want to expand your redemptive potential on earth. You want to become who God wants you to become. You want to do what he wants you to do. You're yielded. You're praying. You're seeking. Any of the choices are fine. Chill. Relax. How many of you tend to be, when it comes to seeking God's guidance, you tend to be more stress anxiety oriented it's like oh god oh please please show me show me show me. I, I don't want to make a mistake i don't want to make a mistake how many be honest confession is good for the soul how many tend to fall into that camp can i see your hands go ahead i actually want you to oh you you're embarrassed you won't put them very high will you <laughs> yeah, okay god's word to you today is relax 
truth of the matter is, and I, w- I wouldn't tell you this if you want to, I've been following Christ for a long time. It is extraordinarily hard to miss God's will for your life if you are yielded and seeking his will. It's almost impossible because even if you and I veer off course, as long as we're moving in the right direction, we're moving to be people that God wants us to be, to be more Christ-like. We're moving to do what God wanted us to do, to be servants of God in this life. If we're moving in the right direction, he can, he can get us back on course very easily. How many know it's a whole lot easier to steer a bicycle when it's moving and pedaling than when you're just sitting, standing still? How many know that? You see, you're, I mean, you guys are sharp. You're, you're with me. When we're moving with God in the right direction... It's easy for him, even if we get off course, to steer us. And it's, I'm just going to say it, it's downright hard to miss God's will. Once you've put your faith in Christ, God takes responsibility for fathering you and I. And he's really good at what he does. He can can get us back on track even when we slip off. So a lot of times we're seeking guidance with tension and anxiety And we really don't need the kind of guidance that we think we need, and that's why we don't get it. God's saying, just make a decision. We think, oh, gee, should I take that career or this career? And God's saying, either one is fine. Should I buy that car? Either one doesn't matter. Should I buy a house? Should I rent? Now, some of these things are overriding principles that need to be considered, but a lot of times it's just make the decision. You're my child. It will be okay. Relax. Let me read you some scripture that has to do with... um, this, this whole thing of expecting guidance when it's necessary. In Psalm 31, 14, and Jacob was seeking or needing guidance concerning timing. It was already clear he was to go back to the land. It's just that he needed to know when. It says, the psalmist said, but I trust in you, O Lord. You are my God, my, what does it say? My times are in your hands. God's going to take care of those timing decisions that you and I are not always uh, aware of. Sometimes time is, is important. Opportunities open, opportunities close. Ecclesiastes 8, 6, it says, For there is a proper what? A proper time and a procedure for every matter. Psalm 48, 14 is a comforting verse. It says, For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide. How long? Even to the end. There's never going to, if you've put your faith in Christ, there's never going to be a time in your life when you feel it and when you don't feel it. There's never going to be a time when God is not guiding you. Psalm 73, 24, it says, You guide me with your counsel. That's God's primary way with his word, his counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. Jesus, Matthew 7, he says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. This is absolute truth. But sometimes we're asking and we're seeking and we're knocking and we don't get what we want because we frankly don't need it. A brilliant ethicist named John Cavanaugh went over to Calcutta, India, when Mother Teresa was still alive. He, he went to her place where she cared for the, the dying and those that were newly dead and so on. And he waited for his time to have an audience with Mother Teresa, and he had this burning question. He wanted to know what should he do with the rest of his life. He was seeking clarity from God. God, what do you want me to do with the rest of my life? That's a good thing. We all would agree with that. What a wonderful thing. This man was willing to change his vocation. And so he finally gets this audience from Mother Teresa, and he says, Mother Teresa, will you pray for me? Will you pray for me that God will give me clarity, clarity what to do with the rest of my life? And Mother Teresa, being a, a spiritual, holy woman, said, No, I won't pray for that. Kind of shocked him. Wouldn't it shock you? You go all the way to Calcutta, India? You want, you want Mother Teresa to pray for you? You're seeking God's will for your life? And she says, No, I won't pray that. She said, I will not pray for clarity. She says, clarity is not what you need. Clarity, she said, is what I've never had. I'll pray for trust. That's what you need. You just need to trust God. And I have found through my life that tends to be the truth. Listen, I've followed Christ for a long time now, a lot of years. I can look back and I can see God guided me there and he guided me there and he guided me then and then he guided me the other time. But I got to be very honest with you. The vast majority of times, the va- and I'm almost tempted to say all, but, but there's probably been a time or two when I knew it for sure. The vast majority of times, I had absolutely no clarity or sense that he was guiding. But what I was doing, 
I was functioning the best that I could as a mature son. I was yielded to him. I was devoted to him. I was saturated with his word. I would seek out other means that I'm going to share with you in a minute where he said that he will counsel us and direct us. And so God ended up guiding me again and again and again and again when I didn't even have a sense of it. It was not until I looked back and I was like, oh, man, I had no clue that that was such a defining uh, moment. I had no clue that was such a fork in the road. I had no awareness that you were, you were guiding me the whole time. But I never had that clarity that I would have liked to have had. So sometimes we don't get guided the way we would like because we simply don't need it. It's not necessary. But when we need that crystal clarity, we can expect it. And if you ask for it and you don't get it, what does that mean? You really didn't need it. You just thought that you did. You say, Randy, that's not very satisfying. I mean, I'm, I'm facing a decision right now, <laughs> and I want to know which way to go. And God's saying, just get moving in the right direction, and whatever decision you make, as long as it's not in clear violation of His Word, and you do need to make sure that, it's going to be okay. So, when we have clarity on God's guidance, the next step is this. We need to take it to take that guidance without any hesitation, without any hesitancy whatsoever. And there's at least four reasons that we should do this. And, and let me just kind of list quickly what they are. The first one is that there are, and I don't want to get you tense people, you anxious-oriented people, more tense and more anxious than you are, but there are some seasons in life, there are some events, there are some circumstances that are very time-sensitive. Jacob's was like this, evidently. God said, now is the time, after 20 years, Jacob, it's time to go home. It's time to, to face life at home. And so sometimes you and I don't know. We don't understand the dynamics that are at work, but there, there's a time sensitivity where God knows you've got to move on this now. You need to make the decision now. Maybe some in this room, you've already had crystal clarity. You know in God's word, he has specifically said there's certain things that he would like you to do to change, to align with his word, some corrections, but you've been hesitating and maybe this morning God's saying, you know, you just need to do it today. I wonder if there's somebody in here, there's a certain trigger. You, you know for a long time God's wanted you to pull it. There's a certain change. There's a certain decision. There's a certain correction maybe. You know it. You know what God's will is, but you really have hesitated. And God's maybe trying to say to you today in all of his love, the time is really important. You're running out of time. You've got to act on this. So when we are clear on God's will, we should move. We should take his guidance without hesitancy because sometimes timing is critical. The other reason is that any time we are clear about God's guidance, we can be sure of one thing. When we take his guidance, it will absolutely deepen our faith. It will deepen our intimacy with God, regardless of what happens along the path. If you follow the rest of the story on Jacob, his life is not smooth. It, it doesn't go all that well. There are still some bumps. But what does happen is this. His trust in God is deepened. His faith in God is matured. His his intimacy with God grows deeper. When you and I receive God's guidance and we take it, no matter what happens in our circumstances, our faith, our trust in God will grow. Our intimacy with God will grow. Now, this becomes tricky because you and I tend to think that if I've found God's guidance, if, if I have really found God's way, the proof will be that things will occur in my circumstances the exact way I wanted them to. And sometimes when we make a decision, we, we think it was God's will, we think we have found God's guidance, but then terrible things start happening. You know, we run into one problem, and then another problem, and then another problem. We, we say, oh no, darn it, I missed it. I know why all this stuff is happening to me. I miss God's will. How did I miss it? How did I miss His will? I'm trying to tell you, you didn't miss His will. The difficulties that may or may not occur have nothing to do with finding his will. You see, the journey is one toward God's global purposes, his larger purposes for his children, his larger purpose for you in this life, and what he's going to guide you toward and guide me toward is that you, every day of your life, increase in growing to the likeness of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's his primary will, that we grow to be more like Christ. It's his primary will that we become 
redemptive agents on this earth, individuals that share truth and love and do what is right in the sight of God for people. So when you take his guidance, your faith is going to grow. And regardless of what your circumstances are, if your trust in God is growing, if your intimacy with God is growing, and sometimes the problems cause us to hang on tight and go deeper with God, do they not? Then you can be sure you have found God's guidance. The third thing that will always happen when we do have God's guidance is, is our character will develop. We will become more Christ-like. You read in Jacob, he ends up having a, a physical wrestling match, a spiritual physical wrestling match with the Lord Jesus Christ himself, and he's forever changed because of this wrestling match. He, he has his name changed from Jacob to Israel, and you and I will become more Christ-like when we find God's guidance and when we take it without any hesitancy. And then finally, our redemptive potential will be greatly expanded. In other words, your capacity, your ability, your opportunity, my opportunity to touch the lives of other people with the love and the truth of Christ will be expanded any time we take God's guidance. Now, these aren't always the things we look for. We look for, okay, this is going to happen and that's going to happen and the other's going to happen, but we're not looking in the right place. We need to look for these four things, and that needs to be the basis of our confidence for taking God's guidance. Now, often when people are seeking for a formula, and I do want to give you one, for seeking and discerning or being sure of God's guidance and His will, uh, it's likened to uh, a boat trying to come into a harbor and needing to align certain lights. And when the lights are all aligned, then you know you're headed straight into the harbor. And, and I want to kind of give you some things, and I'm going to give you a lot of things very quickly. They'll be on the tape of the CD if you want to, you know, seek them at another time. But I want to say when I start that these things do not guarantee, uh, they're not a foolproof formula for you or I, because you see, God's will for your life is not the same as God's will for my life. And, and so you have to factor these things in. But, but I'm going to give you the list anyway. When you're seeking guidance from God, number one, number one, you must go to God's word. The vast majority of things, as I said, that we need guidance on, they're already there. They're already in God's Word. And if you're not sure, go to somebody who is more knowledgeable and more spiritually experienced in God's Word. Seek their counsel. Go to God's Word. Seek godly counsel. Of course, pray. Be yielded. Make the prayer, my, not my will, but yours be done. I just want your way. I want your will. Let me give you a few other things. You've got to take into consideration that you have certain gifts that God's given you, spiritual gifts, and certain talents that are unique to you, you must ask yourself if this decision is going to enable me to further develop and further use those gifts and talents the way God wants me to. You've been given a certain set of desires and passions that are God-given, and they're going to direct you toward God's mission for your life. You need to consider those. You need to consider the experiences that God's given you because he wants you and I to take the experiences and use them to be a blessing to other people. You've got to consider your temperament type. Some of us are introverts, some of us extroverts, some of us detail-oriented, some of us broad-stroke people. All that's part of discerning God's guidance in various ways. You and I must consider our various roles and relationships and responsibilities. If you're a husband or a wife, you've got a certain set of responsibilities and roles that when you're seeking God's guidance, you have to factor that in. You have to then take in some of these other things we mentioned kind of humorously earlier, the open door, the opportunity, God's peace. All those things count once you've gone through these other things. You need to ask the question, if I make this decision, is this going to enhance my Christ-like character development? Is this going to enhance my time and ability and opportunities to reach out for Christ? All these things need to be factored in. They, they all need to be kind of aligned and prayed through and even then, they don't guarantee that you absolutely have crystal clarity on God's will. But what they do guarantee is you can't miss His will ultimately. Ultimately. When you've gone through a process like that, and your heart's like that, you're gold. I'm telling you, heaven is smiling on you. You are the delight of the Father's heart. And there is no way, no way, you will not miss his ultimate will, his guidance will be with you, even when you don't know that it's happening. Let me read you some scripture to just sort of affirm some of this stuff. Psalm 32, 8, it's, it's, uh, I particularly like the ninth verse in this one, but it says in the eighth verse, I will, this is the Lord speaking, he says, I will instruct you 
and teach you in the way you should go. This is this God promising us. He says, I will counsel you and watch over you. And then he says something kind of humorous. He says, do not be like the what? The horse and the, or the mule, which have no understanding, must, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come. You know what God's really saying there? He's saying, listen, I've given you a, re- a reasoning ability. I've given you a conscience and a mind and emotions and will. He's saying, don't be that robotic person. Don't be like an animal that needs to be pulled or tugged. Be sensitized to my truth and then, then move on it. Don't, don't, don't make me force you. That's, God wants mature sons and daughters to just spontaneously do his word and will because we're saturated with it and we love him. Psalm 48, 17, it says, I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you. Who does what? Who directs you in the way you should go. He promises he, he'll guide us. Even when we don't know it, he's directing. Psalm 25, 5, it shows the condition that our hearts need to be in. Guide me. Here's the desire for it. Guide me in your truth. That's God's word. And teach me, for you are God my Savior. And my hope is in you all day long. And then it tells the kind of people that he, gets, uh, s- that he can successfully guide. He guides the what? The humble. You gotta be, we have to be teachable and humble. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. Who then is the man that fears, and that means reverences the Lord? He will instruct him in the way chosen for him. Now notice that. There's a way chosen for you and I. God's got a unique call for each of our lives. And when we're humble, God will will see to it that we find that way chosen for each of us. Romans 8, 28, it just gives that that global desire for God that we know he's always going to guide us toward. It says, and we know that in all things God works for the what? For the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose, not our purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed or transformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. He's always going to move us toward character, Christ-like character development. And then there is an element of faith and trust in this. It says in Hebrews 11, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him earnestly. I want to close with um, um, an illustration that sort of, it's pertinent to our circumstances uh, of where we're at here today, uh, something that happened back this past February. I mean, this whole... This whole challenge that we've had about either having a, a home for our church or being literally cast out on the street and having to seek a home, this started a year ago in June. Uh, it's been over a year now. And it has been up and down, up and down. We, we have at times looked like we were never going to have a home and we we're going to get cast out of this building. And then times it looked like we were going to maybe have it. But it reached a real dark impasse in February. Uh, we had tried lender after lender after lender, and they all came back and said the same thing that we needed a three-year track record demonstrating that we really could afford, you know, an $8 million loan. Uh, And it was just useless. We had tried. We had exhausted numerous, numerous places. And so uh, Mark Lynch, the son of the owner, or the previous owner, uh, Francis Lynch, you know, he's the one who's been dealing with me through this thing. In February, he said, look, Randy, he said, Church of Redeemer wants to buy the complex. They've got the money. They can do the deal. And he says, I'm running out of time. I've got to do this deal. In two weeks, he said, I've got to make a decision. And he says, I just, I just think you need to just accept it, that Church of Redeemer is going to have the facility. Uh, they said they'll let you lease here for a few years. It was going to be a huge, expensive lease, but a few years. And then they were going to graciously kick us out. But that's a whole nother thing. Anyway, um, Mark was pr- trying to be reasonable with me. He said, Randy, look, it's at least you have some time. This will give you some time. So just accept it because I've got to make a decision, he said, in two weeks. And I said, Mark, okay, we got two weeks. I said, let me, ju- let me just try a couple things. And I just went online once again. And I'm telling you, we had already tried numerous lenders. We got the same reply again and again. I went online again, and we got a bunch more and started contacting them one by one by one. Most of them said the same thing. Nope. You don't have enough income, track record, over three years is not visible, blah, blah, blah. And then finally, one, this group called ARCS, said, no, I think we can help you. 
And the guy on the other end of the line was a guy named Tom DeMont. This was like on a Wednesday. Listen, this guy was up here that weekend. He was here that Saturday. He was meeting with me. He was meeting with Mark Lynch and Mark Lynch's mother. He was sitting down with us and saying, I think we can do this loan. We can make this deal, I believe. I think we can make it happen. He said to me, he said, God has assured me that his hand is on your church. And it's going to work. It's going to be okay. Now, we had been turned down continuously. And I've got to be honest with you. What I did was not rational. Everything in my rational mind, when Mark Lynch told me on the phone, he says, look, man, just accept it. You know, I know you don't want this, but just accept it. It, it is what it is. At least you'll have some time. Everything in my rational mind said, you know what? He's right. We, we, we're beaten. We've tried, but it's just not going to be. And I can't tell you that all of a sudden I heard the voice of God and the heavens parted and I don't know if I was in body or out of body, but God said, try again. You know, nothing like that happened. Nothing. All I felt was confused and scared, and, but something extraordinarily subtle. It wasn't rational. My rational mind was saying, just accept it. It's done. Take your beating. It's okay. But something in me said, no, try it. Just try it again. And I look back. I look back. I can't tell you. I can't tell you why other than it was clearly, clearly the guidance of God. And my life is full of these kind of experiences. I mean full. I am not aware when they're happening that it's God guiding. I look back and I'm like, oh man, all I want to do is hit my knees and ask, why on earth have you been this good to me all these years? And God's hand is on this church, not because we're the best or the brightest or the holiest or any of that. I don't know why. Just because he is loving and he's good and he's wonderful. And I'm telling you this morning, if you have put your faith in Christ and you've made the decision to be his follower, this God is our God. And he will guide you all your life. He will guide you when you know it and he will guide you when you don't know it. He will guide you when you deserve it and he will guide you when you don't deserve it at all. And he loves to bring blessing into the lives of his people and through the lives of his people. He loves us and he'll guide us all the rest of our days. I want to close by just suggesting that maybe God's guided you all through your life to this very moment to let you know that you are his beloved. And if you've never put your faith in Christ, never made that, that critical decision that every human faces to Follow Jesus fully. Everybody's following somebody. If you've never put your faith in Christ and said, I'm going to follow Jesus the rest of my life, this God has guided you to this moment and said, forgiveness of your sins is being offered to you, the gift of everlasting life in your kingdom, and my unending guidance, my son, my daughter, if you'll make this decision to trust in my son and follow him fully forever. If you've not made that decision, I hope before you leave this building you'll do that today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are truly the faithful God. Uh, the God who's in control when everything seems out of control. The God that is ever present, always with your people. You guided Jacob. You give us just the guidance we need when we need it. And you lead us and you direct us even when we least expect it. You are good beyond what we even dare to believe. We can't fathom this kind of love. We can't fathom this kind of goodness. But we thank you for it. If there's anyone here today who, who's just still afraid to trust in you with their whole heart, may that be removed forevermore this day. And may we leave here maturing, maturing sons and daughters who understand the way you guide your people. Father, we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen.